take a look at those two channels and look for whatever info you want to look for. So we are going to give the floor to Glenn Stanton. Glenn Stanton is the studies um, director of the um, association Focus on the Family. I was lucky enough to visit their um, headquarters in Colorado Springs in 2010. I was participating in a World Congress on Family of uh, fam Families meeting and I was impressed by all the initiatives that they were launching to give their support to families to help to help the couple um, marriages to educate our um, children according to Christian values. Mr. Stanton has a degree in philosophy, in communication and religion. He, is al he also has a PhD in philosophy, history and religion by the University of Florida. He worked as a policies advisor regarding marriage and family for George W. Bush's administration the president of the U.S. in the White House, and he has written eight books on marriage and families. His presentation, I'm sure, will be very useful for many of us who gather here today in Madrid and for those who are following online. How to love our neighbors, our LGTBI neighbors, even when we do not agree with them. That's the title of his presentation. Thank you very much, Glenn, for your presentation. We, I am the first speaker after lunch, okay? Now, I'm a Christian, and Christians always seek the will of God, and sometimes we're unsure what the will of God is, but there's one time that I absolutely know what the will of God is, and that's at nap time. Yes, it is God's will for me to take a nap right now. Let me tell you with all surety, it is not God's will for you to take a nap right now. No buenos noches. What I want to talk to you about comes from the work that I do in the United States, and that is going to college campuses and debating the issue of gender. And increasingly, that job has gotten very, very interesting. Let me say, I've noticed none of the speakers have spoken to you or to you. So I'm going to pay attention that you people exist, okay? The job has gotten very, very interesting in the last couple of years because of what is happening with the gender issue. And so the talk that I'm going to give is titled, the five fatal flaws of gender theory. The five fatal flaws of gender theory. So we're gonna do some role playing in this presentation that in a way, I am going to be two people. I'm going to be a gender theory professor and you're the students. And now being good students, pay attention to what I'm saying and take seriously what I'm saying, and then I'm going to become a student as well and ask questions, the questions that you may be having and wondering about what I'm teaching as a professor. And what we're going to see is there is a large disconnect between what the professors are teaching and what real practical life has to say about it. And what's interesting is that the gender theorists, the students and the professors don't even see the inconsistencies. And it really is quite remarkable that they don't. Now, one of my books, this is my latest book, Loving My LGBT Neighbor, Being Friends in Grace and Truth. The most significant part of the book is the subtitle, Being Friends in Grace and Truth. And I wrote this book out of the experience that I've had of interacting with gay and lesbian leaders on college campuses. And we have to love everybody. But we do not have to agree with everybody, do we? We get loved 
by other people, and they don't agree with everything that we say. So in a sentence, what this book is about is we should always treat the person in front of us. What I like to say, the person that you're looking eye to eye with, connecting heart to heart with, we should always treat them with absolute love and grace, uncompromising. But we always deal with the issue, the facts of the matter, with absolute uncompromising truth. Treat the individual with grace, but deal with the issue with truth. And hope that the other individual can understand the difference between the two. That's very significant. I've got a few of these copies with me, um, and I like to sell them because my kids need shoes. I've got growing kids. Um, so we have that. But I want to lay that as the foundation for what we're going to talk about today is always understand these issues in terms of the person, love them, care for them, embrace them. But that doesn't mean we have to compromise on the truth itself. In fact, it's loving to speak the truth and to speak the truth in love. Remember this, that truth without love can be abusive. Love without truth can be merely sentimental. The two need one another. And so let me start my talk by, um, again, we're going to talk about listening to the gender theory professor and being good students, really trying to learn what it is that he or she is saying but then looking about how it works out in real life. This is a true story. A number of years ago, I'm from Colorado, and there was this big gathering of a number of different universities in Denver, Colorado, and it was a gender studies group that put it together. And they invited me to come along and be on the panel. They you know, wanted one of these strange, weird guys from you know, the Christian community to come speak. And so I came, I was happy to do that. The professor at the very start of the conference, he comes up, introduces himself to the group, and it, again, it's this gender studies group, lesbians, trans, you know, gay individuals, um, bisexual, everybody's there. And he says this, now, my name is Professor Simpson, and you do not know whether I am a male or a female. You can't tell by the way that I look. And I wanted to go, can I take a shot? Just, just a guess. Um, but everybody else in the audience was like, yes, yes, we, we can't know whether you're a male or female until we hear your story. Okay, so then he went into his talk, and his talk was really fascinating. It was about sexism in advertising. And it was really a great talk. He showed all these slides of advertisements and he would say see this woman how she's down on all fours and the men are over her in a dominant position he would say you know good then go to the next one see this and see that beer bottle and Miriam spoke very honestly she used certain words so I can speak honestly too see that beer bottle how it has a phallic symbolism and then see the man or the woman, how, you know, how she's positioned with that bottle. Again, the dominance and sexual objectivity of the women, woman. And he kept going through probably about 10 ads like this, okay? And so, I have a question when it comes to the Q&A time. Okay, now get this. As the gender studies professor, he's saying, you can't know who I am, male or female, or any other thing, until you hear my story. And then over here, his presentation, see the woman, she's subject to the man. See those men, they're dominant over her. What questions do you have, students? Exactly. You're smart students, right? Okay. And, and that's what I said is, I shot my hand up immediately, and they're like, okay, the Yahoo... 
I don't know how that translates. The nut is going to say something. And I said exactly that. Professor, now you said that at the beginning of your introduction that we couldn't know who you were and that we had to hear your story. But your whole talk was predicated on judging without hearing their stories who was male and female. This man is a PhD. He's a professor at a significant university in Colorado. The look on his face was, and I don't know if this will translate well, but, oh crap, that's a good question. I mean, just like unbelievable. And so the gist of my talk is going to be about when you start to tell lies, guess what? It's going to come back to you at some point. You're going to contradict yourself. I don't know if you have this saying in your country, but parents will teach their kids in the United States, and I'm sure that you do. If you're going to be a good liar, you must have what? A good memory. Now, our parents weren't telling us, let me tell you how to be a good liar. They're saying, son, daughter, if you're going to lie, you are going to contradict yourself, and you're going to have to remember everything else that you said so it never conflicts. Gender theory is a lie. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody involved in it is a liar, but they're deceived in trying to take reality and turn it upside down. And so they will contradict themselves at so many different turns. And that's what we're going to talk about. Now, everybody really this morning talked about the difference between sex and gender. We understand that. But I'm going to go through the five fatal inconsistencies. And so the first part of this is going to be me as the gender theory professor. Now, understand, students, and write this down in your books. Gender is a spectrum. Gender is a spectrum. Facebook, a number of years ago, when you go on to do your profile, you can do married, single, you know, your political affiliation. But under gender, they had male and female. Well, they decided to change that, and they came up with 59 different genders. 59. And you're like, I could probably find my gender in the 59. What they found out was what most of us know. People complained, why are you, Facebook, prejudiced, prejudiced and excluding me because my gender is not in the 59 genders? When you're just making up gender and gender exists in your head and what you think you are, you are not going to be able to capture all the different genders. And so what did Facebook do? They decided just to put in a category of, you fill in what your gender is. And you know that they were frustrated about that. Like, good Lord, seriously? 59 different genders, and you say we don't have your gender? They understood how ridiculous this gets. So gender is a spectrum. And we need to know that there are more than two genders. The two-gender idea is called binarity. Binary. There are only two genders. But we know that there are more than two genders. Why? Because there are t-shirts that tell us. <laughs> and as you know, they couldn't print it on a t-shirt if it wasn't true. We have laws in the United States about that. I don't know if you do in your country. But get this. Okay, when you go to order your shirt and you pick out who it's for, the gender, more than two genders, they give you two choices, male or female. You can't make this stuff up. I didn't order one of those shirts because it didn't have my gender because I'm a, you know, and just make it up. Okay, when you start studying this stuff, that there's a spectrum of genders, 
then you start recognizing the inconsistencies in different places. I get the New Yorker, the magazine, the New Yorker, and this woman here is Rachel Maddow. Rachel Maddow is, um, she has a very popular evening cable talk show on MSNBC. She is a lesbian. She's very progressive, very progressive. That means she knows that gender is a spectrum, okay? The woman writing the article for the New Yorker, she most likely is not a conservative Christian, and she knows that gender is a spectrum. So I'm reading this story in Rachel Maddow's office at MSNBC Studios. There is a rack on which hang about 30 elegant women's jackets, okay? For all the different kinds of jackets that she could have as a lesbian woman, why does she only have women's jackets? You know why? Because the person writing this article and Rachel Maddow cannot keep up with, oh, that's right, there's a whole bunch of different genders, therefore I should have a whole bunch of different jackets. The next one, they're elegant, okay? Nobody says to a man, oh, that's a very elegant outfit you have today, right? Elegant is a woman's term. And they use that word. Now next... At 2 o'clock, she meets with her staff of 20 young men and women. Okay, here's what must have happened when Rachel Maddow is hiring people. Yes, Rachel, I'd like to come work for your show. I think it's fantastic, but I'm a transgender, hyper, whatever. And she says, well, no, I'm sorry. We're only hiring men and women. Right? If they're not paying attention to what they're supposed to be doing, they fall into the idea that gender is not a spectrum. When you're lying, you have to remember, okay, I'm lying and I have to keep my story straight. When they are not paying attention, they cannot keep their story straight. They reflect if you will, this is a bad word, but nature. Okay? Now, some of us are very familiar with this. This is the gingerbread person, not the gingerbread man. This is a, a teaching device that's being taught in so many schools in the United States and Canada and all over the world. Now, I want you to notice, this is not the gingerbread man, it's the gingerbread person. Because, again, we know that there's all kinds of different genders. But notice that, version 2.0 on there. Version 2.0, okay? When you start to contradict yourself, then you have to back up and change your story. And so, what do they do when they're changing their story? They go to version, not point three zero, but 3.1, 3.2, 3.3. They have not been able to keep their story straight, and people keep criticizing them. Hey, you forgot this, or you've said this wrong. So they have to go through all these different versions. Now they've gotten criticized, not just for the gingerbread person, but people are misspeaking and saying like we would the gingerbread man. That's very bad. That's a faux pas. We shouldn't be doing that. So what did they do? Seriously. But the gingerbread unicorn, I mean, if they're talking about it, they would probably call him him or her. You know, they would make those mistakes. Okay, second, binary is bad, but LGBT require it. Think about this. I'm the uh, professor now. Binary is bad. This idea that humanity exists only in male and female and in male and female only is an illusion. It's prejudiced. It's bigotry. And it doesn't consist of and it doesn't connect with 
human experience, okay? Write that down in your notes, students. That's a fundamental tenet of gender theory. Well, then you'll ask, well, tell me what LGBT is. Okay, folks, students, that's the next thing. The L, that's a lesbian. What is a lesbian? A lesbian is a woman that only has sex with other women. Who does she not have sex with? Men. Who else of the 59 genders does she not have sex with? It doesn't even come into the equation, right? And we as good students would ask that. Professor, you just told us earlier that gender's not a spectrum. I mean, that it is a spectrum. And you're telling me that a lesbian is a woman that only has sex with other women and not men, but there's nobody else kind of in play there? Well, um, yes, that's what I'm saying. Okay, well then, what's the G? Well, the G is a man that is only interested in one of the other genders, and that is a man. Well, who is he not interested in? Your gender theory professor would not say, well, he's not interested in women. He's not interested in... We don't even have names for all the different genders. But me, as your gender studies professor, would say, a man who is not interested in women. Pretty binary, huh? Okay, now we come to the good part. The bees, bisexual, bicycle, bifocal, bicoastal, binary. The bisexual is somebody who has sex with not every conceivable gender, but only two genders, male or female. Okay, now trans. Trans, what is a trans person? It is somebody who is assigned female at birth, but identifies as a male, or is assigned male at birth, but identifies as a female. And now us as good students is like, okay, we were told earlier that, that gender isn't binary, but so what are the other types of transgenders? Well, there aren't any because in the community, they will ask you if you're a transgender, are you an MTF or an FTM, male to female or female to male? Pretty binary. Binary is bad. Binary is a flat earth system, but the whole LGBT thing is predicated on nothing but binary. When you bring that up, again, that phrase, oh crap, you can just see it on their faces. Okay, this is interesting. So non-binary individuals, this is fox and owl. They are a British couple, and they were on a British morning talk show. And one is Fox, one is Al, and again, they say they identify as non-binary. Okay, for all you people, all you conservatives, these people are supposed to blow your mind. Okay, you have no category for these people whatsoever. But let me let you guess what this person is. Okay? You, you're smart, you think, well, he's a male. But you know there's a curveball in here. That's baseball terminology. Like, oh, I bet he's physically a female. And then the other one, Owl, she looks like a woman, but no, she doesn't fit into your boxes. What do you think she is? Well, she's actually physiologically or identified at birth as a male. Again, they're not non-binary, they're just binary and they've just switched, okay? You're not fooling anybody. Non-binary would be, okay, we have no category for these people whatsoever. We have to be introduced to the terms under which they identify themselves. I love this. Royal Dutch Airlines sent this out as a tweet to connect themselves with the gay market. And the moment they send it out, it got so hammered, even by gay activists. It doesn't matter who you click with, 
happy hashtag prime pride Amsterdam, okay? Now here's the thing. It doesn't matter who you click with, but if a KL, KLM flight goes down, you better hook up heterosexually or you're going to die. <laughs> Gravity does not recognize a diversity of genders. And that's interesting because even their KLM was kind of like, again, that phrase, oh crap. Now, this is very important. I'll run through this really quick. Male and female are cultural constructs that you identify as a male and you present yourself as a male because our culture determines what a male should look like. You present yourself as a lovely female because culture says this is what you should look like. It doesn't really exist in reality. None of our male and femaleness do. But think about this. If I now am a trans woman, now I'm absolutely, definitively, conclusively, before the foundation of the world, absolutely what nature made me to be. You can't have it both ways, folks, that you're actually only male or female if you're not actually in nature, male and female, but that's what they believe. One gay activist said when Bruce Jenner switched to Caitlyn Jenner, finally he is the woman that he always has been and truly is. But professor, you said male and female were just cultural constructs. I'm confused. Well, if you're confused, then you understand it perfectly. Real quick, androgyny, they say, is natural. That we as human beings are more naturally androgynous. But think about any androgynous individual. I tend to think of David Bowie, okay? David Bowie, in being androgynous, has to go through hours of makeup to make himself androgynous. Today in the fashion world, you do not have androgynous clothing. You do not have an androgynous clothing line. If there is, you probably don't know about it. You go down the wonderful shopping streets of Madrid to the very fancy shops. You find the women's clothing shops. They are incredibly female and feminine. The fashion industry, as cutting edge as it is, is not moving into a, a, an androgynous sort of way. I'm being hounded right now. Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm going to wrap it up right now. The last one, and this is what we're talking about today, is my little boy is actually a little girl. I don't need to spend any time on that but it is an absolute illusion, and the people who live by this theory cannot even live by it consistently. Look at this. This is a CNN story. Transgender man gives birth to a boy. He's a transgender man, but he's got a uterus. I like to say he's a man who's got a uterus, and he's not afraid to use it. Okay? His name is Tristan Reese, is a trans man who had a baby with his partner of seven years, Biff Chaplow. Isn't that a great name, Biff Chaplow? Well, what did they have? Well, first of all, before we answer that, we need to understand that Tristan was assigned female identity at birth. They did not understand who he really was at birth, so they just said, this this thing, this individual has a vagina, so we're going to say female. And he was misunderstood. He was misgendered. Okay? So, what did Tristan have? From these people, from this philosophy, we should learn that he had a person. And we'll find out later what that gender is. But no. CNN says that Tristan Reese, a transgendered man living in Portland, has given birth to a boy. 
And the boy's name is Leo. Leo is an unmistakably masculine name. Now, if they were consistent with their theory, these two individuals, they would say, we are not going to assign a gender to our child just because it has a penis or a vagina. Because that happened to me, and it was unjust. But what did they do? Baby comes out of the womb. We have a boy. And they probably felt real tears, real emotion. We've got a boy. They could not keep up and consistent with their own philosophy. Gender theory that is just simply based on theory itself and not rooted in any kind of science whatsoever. In fact, it is intrinsically anti-science. These two things butt head-to-head -head constantly. And so like I've started doing, as you're reading these stories, look for the inconsistencies. Look for how they contradict themselves and cannot even remain consistent with their own self-professed beliefs. That is one of the most telling indicators that what is being told is a lie. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we should da sit down here. Um, yeah, he saw so, si alguien tiene alguna pregunta, ya if you have a question, I've actually been handed out quite a few of them, but if you have a question, please write it on the cards and hand your card to one of the hostesses that are in the room and they will give them back to me. I'm going to speak in Spanish. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Muy bien. Um, tengo una Wonderful then. I have a question uh, from Miguel Angel. He says, Dear Glenn Stanton, if culturally I'm defined as a woman, but biologically I'm a man and I'm androgynous aesthetically, what can you tell me about my true gender? Might I recommend counseling? <laughs> Not as a judgment. No. <laughs> I mean, in a sense, that is exactly the right question. I asked, at Focus on the Family, we're a conservative, evangelical, pro-family ministry, but we host gay and lesbian individuals and groups to come dialogue. We want to hear from you. We want to talk to you. They don't do that with us. But one time there was a, a group that came, and I, we're walking from one building over to the other, and I asked the question, I said, now, I ask you this question very seriously. What if I told you that I was an embodied male, lesbian, transgender, and I just started throwing all these terms together, you know, mm -hmm. that are self-contradictory on purpose. And I said, what if I told you and truly believed that was my story? She said, well, Glenn, I would have to take you at your word that that was your story. I mean, I'm asking this question in a serious way, but in a ridiculous way. And she says, if that's what's happening up here, there is nobody that can tell you that you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I talk about in these talks, and you probably maybe didn't tell, but I transed back and forth six times while I was giving this talk. <laughs> and you think, well, that's ridiculous. Yeah. That was my story. And I can tell you exactly when I transed back and forth through my talk. According to gender theory, there is nothing that nobody can say to tell me that I was wrong. That's how ridiculous this is because it exists purely up here in one's self-understanding. Thank you. Uh, there is another one. Mar Maria Jose, eh, otra pregunta. Here we have another question from Maria Jose. Quite often what you say, this truth, when talking about uh, gender theory, this is true, uh, when you're talking about uh, gender theory, they accuse you of offending. How can you make them understand that it's not about hate, but rather about love? Big, big, big question. And 
first of all, we should not be intimidated by that. Let me, let me tell you a story, and I will have other people start to tell me a particular story, and I can tell you how it ends. And this is primarily from a Christian point of view. A Christian person, a radio interviewer or whatever will tell you, I have, and I'll, I'll tell you one specific one. This woman was in Chicago, African-American woman, and she says, I have a neighbor, two men that live next door. I'm a Christian. They're two gay men, but we had a wonderful relationship. He loves to garden. I love to garden. We would spend lots of time gardening together, giving each other tips about how to make our gardens work. We walked together every morning before work, three days a week. His name was Frank. I loved Frank, had a relationship with Frank for three years, nearly on a daily basis. He learned that I worked for a big Christian ministry in Chicago, and he said, I am sorry, I cannot be your friend because I cannot be friends with somebody who is a bigot. Wow. Okay? I have heard that same sort of story, and I want to you know, interrupt the Christian and say, let me tell you that, how that ends. Now, get this. Bigots are not inclined to one-on-one make friends with their gay neighbors, two, garden with them and share tips and tools and things like that, three, get up at the crack of dawn three times a week and walk with them. See, the, the interesting thing there is not so much how you act toward the individual, it's the position you hold. And so the question that you have to ask is, Frank, I'm a Christian, you're a gay man, I don't know what your spiritual beliefs are, but can I be your friend? Can I love you even though I don't agree with your sexuality? And I don't expect you to agree with my sexuality. Ask that question. Judge me by my behavior toward you. Is it either kind or is it mean? But don't judge me on what I believe. I'm not going to judge you on what you believe. They need to be so pressed on that issue. And the answer there is simply to ask them, I want to be your friend. I know your story. I know who you are. I'm a Christian. Can I be your friend and disagree with you? And let them answer that question. Um, a, very, una pregunta. a very similar question now. How do we deal with a transgender person who hates us? I'm not talking so much about a person that we share our garden with, but rather I understand that the question is making reference to um, situations in which we hop, we hop on the bus or, or we are uh, making our bus tour around and we are having rocks thrown at us or we are having people yelling at us on our faces. How do you treat that, people, that the person? Um. It's, it's interesting is that you come to everybody with this idea, I am going to be your friend as much as I possibly can be your friend until you give me reason to think otherwise. That doesn't really have anything to do with this issue, but you know what? I want to be your friend, you're a classmate at school, but you keep calling me names. What am I going to do? You know what? Don't really want to be your friend, okay? But if we can talk, if we can interact, if we can be civil with one another, I want to be your friend all day long. But we do not owe anybody a friendship, per se, when they're being ugly to us, dangerous to us, threatening us. We are called to love them, but love is different than friendship. We can love from a distance, we can pray for them, Paul did that as he was being stoned, but he wasn't these people's friends necessarily. So the important thing is, as, you know, as Paul says, as much as it is possible, be at peace with everybody. I love that phrase, as much as it is possible. You know what? People throwing rocks at you. You know what? Come over to my house for dinner next week, <laughs> right? I mean, we just don't do that, but we can pray for them. We can bless them. But we are not called necessarily to be their friends. It's what we teach our kids. If you want to be, have friends, be a friend. And that's just very true. Now, we act graciously toward them. 
we think about what is it about them that has them wanting to throw rocks at me? It means they don't have a case for what they believe. They're confused. They're angry. They're hurt. We have a heart of compassion toward them. But that doesn't mean we go out and say, oh, please throw more rocks at me. No, we protect ourselves. We call the police when it happens. But we try to honor them as people as much as we can. Simplemente en el grupito de... Quite simply, I just wanted to say that the group of people that welcomed us this morning with those banners that who tried to prevent us from entering the venue. We actually called the police when we saw them, and the police asked them to step away. They stepped on the side, and then we managed to get through. And then later on, uh, the police uh, seized some of the things that they had with them, and they were carrying a rock this big. We didn't say that before. They're no longer here. But why did they bring a rock? Of course, they didn't use it. But uh, this type of things happen. And at the end of the day, these people are people who are confused. Often they don't know what they want. They're just suffering and they don't know how to express it. And I've seen that actually. And there was this uh, transgender woman who was throwing eggs at me when I traveled to Barcelona. She was uh, reported uh, afterwards. There was a trial. And during the trial, she recognized that she had thrown eggs at us and ketchup. And my lawyer asked me if I wanted to withdraw the report at the point when she recognized that she had not that. And I said, if she asks uh, for uh, pardon, if she uh, apologizes, then we'll dr withdraw the, um, the report. We're not going against them. We're just trying to stand up for ourselves and defend our right to express ourselves and educate our children fundamentally. Just another quick question. Sorry for uh, the digression, for the anecdote. I actually think that the UN has admitted 112 genders. Is that the case? Miriam had kind of mentioned this morning, and there are um, gender theorists who say that there are as many genders as there are people. And actually, that gets more to the truth, because Miriam was saying, I'm a male, you're a male father, but we're different kinds of males. I'm a male, you're a male, but we're different kinds. Our gender, if you will, is demonstrated in a hundred different ways. But like fox and owl, we never confuse who the male or who the female is. There's just 101 different ways of being a male or a female. That's important for us to understand. It's the other side that really does have these narrow, small box ideas of what male and female should be. Will men do this and women do this? Well, in the United States, a darling of the extreme right is Sarah Palin, the old governor for Alaska and ran with John McCain. Okay, she hunts, she can shoot any kind of gun, she can field dress a moose without any help. I mean, she's a dude, right? But no, she's a, she's a very attractive woman. The people from the right, nobody on the right says, she needs to get back in the kitchen where she belongs. The people on the right are like, go girl, okay? <laughs> so we don't act that way, but they act that way in many ways. Women are supposed to do this, men are supposed to do this. They have this very narrow view of, of what things are. The, the throwing the rocks thing real quick is, I mean, think about that. Who is it, and when do you first experience somebody throwing rocks at you? Coming home from the second grade or the primary schools, Mama, this boy threw rocks at me. Yeah. Well, just stay away from him. I mean, that's what children do. And so we don't blast these activists as children, but our heart breaks for them. Why are you acting this way? You are demonstrating to the world really how juvenile and broken you are. Nobody looks at them and says, well, I bet they have a good reason to throw rocks. You know? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and the last question, because uh, I think we have to finish. Um, ¿Por qué? Why no psychiatrist association in the United States is uh, reporting 
everything uh, that you just exposed uh, that uh, is going to drive people crazy? That's the question. Well, no way. I love the question because really what it comes down to is the death of free thinking in the academic professionals, uh, professions. These people cannot ask critical questions. Journalists and academics are in the job of questioning and not taking things at face value. But here, they ask no questions whatsoever. Even the crazy, obvious questions. And so why is that happening? I don't know. I think, as a Christian, and there's lots of different reasons, but I think as a Christian, I say this kind of tongue-in-cheek, it's almost as if there is a spiritual conspiracy coming over the people, guiding them to deny what it means to be male and female. Why? Because God says for Jews, Christians, and Muslims, on the first page of Scripture, let us create man in our image according to our likeness. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. Satan hates what God is. God is, represents himself mysteriously in humanity as only two stories, male or female. Why do you think Satan is so much attacking this idea and truth of male and female today, and so many people are buying into it? There is a large conspiracy behind it, and it is a metaphysical conspiracy, but also a physical conspiracy as well. That's just my take on it, but that's a very big question. How can these very smart, smart people seem so unintelligent and so uncurious and critical of just any idea there. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias. <laughs>